Hey guys, Desolator Magic here with the final round of spoilers from Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. And of course, being the last day, we got the just absolute dump of common draft fodder, so uh, I'm skipping the majority of them. I just picked out a couple interesting cards, uh, quite a few uncommons really. So like, for example, Golden Tail Disciple. Oh boy, a 2-3 for three, 3 with lifelink. Also an enchantment creature, Fox Monk. Yeah, I'm skipping stuff like that. But then there's Imperial Recovery Unit. Uh, this is a white artifact vehicle, 3 cost 3-4 three, with crew 2, so pretty good. And when it attacks, return target creature or vehicle card with mana value 2 or less from your graveyard to your hand. Now that is a useful, awesome card. Still way too much graveyard recursion in at least 3 colors in this set, but uh, you know, it's not this card's fault. Next up, Repel the Vile. It's a 4 cost white instant, choose one, either exile target creature with power 4 or greater, or exile target enchantment. So the optionality, to me, is not really worth 4. I can't imagine somebody would, like, really mainboard this in a, you know, standard constructed deck, but this is, like, amazing for draft and sealed. And that's usually how, you know, removal that costs 4 or 5 in the common slot works, you know, it's just there for that purpose. People like to say, it's a bad card. Well, you gotta remember that other formats exist, and like I've said before, a lot of the problems with card interactions that overpowered stuff is because half the set is designed for draft and half is for constructed, and when one accidentally crosses over, you get a problem. Splitting their attention like that, it's it's just a recipe for disaster, and it has been for the last, you know, 27 years. Next up, Disruption Protocol. It's a double blue instant. As an additional cost to cast this spell, tap an untapped artifact you control. So improvise, it's like invoke, but only for um, artifacts. Or pay one additional generic mana, and then counter target spell. So this is just straight up cancel, double blue plus one, except you can improvise the third mana. Now, would you tap a treasure? Sure, why not? Why wouldn't you? Um, would you tap a vehicle? Uh, not if you need it, so... But assuming you're running an artifact deck and you don't need one of your artifacts to be, you know, untapped, you've literally got the spell counter spell here. Double blue counter anything. That's nuts. Next up, uh, Mirror Shell Crab. If I see a crab, I put it on screen. Crabs, Leviathans, Octopi, and uh, whatever else it is, they change it once in a while, is an absolute meme in the game. So it is a seven cost artifact creature crab. So I guess that technically qualifies it as a submarine. It has ward three and it's a five seven. So, you know, okay. If you invest this much in it, you probably should get ward. But then again, what color is probably best able to protect their uh, gigantic creatures? And the answer is these days green with freaking snake skin and the other 50 versions of it. But normally blue, so I think Ward 3 is a little much, but I mean, this isn't like the game ending threat to end all threats here. But it has channel 3, discard Mirror Shell Crab, and counter target spell or ability unless its controller pays 3. So you get a universal single blue counter spell that counters any spell of any type or an ability that's a triggered ability or an activated ability. That is insane. This is like a tier one counter spell, at least in standard, that also might result in a crab eventually, okay? Not the other way around. Now I'm saying, oh my gosh, you unstoppable cancel meets void slime, but if they pay three, they buy their way out of it. So one is pointless. They have one mana. Two, I might get away with it. Three, okay, they may or may not have three. That's three is where it starts to get like, I could rely on this the majority of the time. It's going to suck if they could pay it, though, especially if you're trying to stop a uh, free ability, just some triggered ability at the beginning of turn or whatever, when they have full mana. A Planeswalker ability, you can stop it with this. Those are considered activated abilities. But if they haven't spent any mana yet that turn, uh, yeah, they're probably going to pay their way out of it. And that's what makes me hesitate to mainboard it, but this is just so good. Uh, next up, Futurist Sentinel. It's a four-cost blue artifact vehicle 6-6 with crew three. So just straight up giant blue vehicle. It's just plain decent. I think this would be pretty good and limited. If you're not familiar with the term, limited is basically sealed or draft. Arguably by definition cube and probably some other things I'm forgetting. Next up, Mnemonic Sphere. AKA the Artifact Affinity Paperweight. You know they're pushing this. This is the most obvious thing I've ever seen. Uh, and we already have like Bag of Holding and that's colorless. So, and then we got like, you know, the backpack, the books. I mean, you're going to just be able to drop in dumb stuff that just, you know, what do they call it? Cantrips itself. So I should probably read the cards. So it makes sense. So it's a two cost blue artifact, pay two, sack it, draw two cards, and then channel, pay one, discard mnemonic sphere, draw a card. So it's not just ETB draw a card, but it's pretty darn close because it's, oh, well, ETB and then pay two and get two cards. So yep, this is just an artifact affinity builder. And then when you don't need it or you drastically, you know, need cards, you just dump it. Otherwise it sits there, big old paperweight and counts as an artifact. 
Next up, Planar Incision. I just included this because it's a Jenga Taxius card and it's a Story Spotlight card. So it's also a two-cost blue instant, and exile target artifact or creature, then return it to the battlefield under its owner's control with a plus one plus one encounter on it. So you can actually target some giant stacked up, you know, whatever, like a Luminarch Aspirant with eight counters on it, and return it with one counter on it. Hey, otherwise you'd probably target your own thing. So if it's an enchantment creature, you get a creature and or enchantment ETB, which is pretty nuts. But the flavor text says, Jin Gataxius had long coveted the secrets of planeswalking. Spirits that could pass between worlds made for perfect test subjects. Oh, so he's in Kamigawa because they do stuff with spirits. Also, uh, the last thing I know that they did was his, uh, what, cousin? I don't know. Um, Vorinclex showed up to Kaldheim and stole some of that fancy rainbow sap that does, I don't know, something turns people into gods or something. You know, something minor like that. I think he stole the sap, not the refined beverage, but he killed the person that made it. I don't know. It was a while ago. I'm trying to block out Keldheim for what it did to the game, but the lore was on point. So spirits can pass between worlds. What's going on there? Like, I, I, I thought the whole thing was history and time travel. And was that his doing or they're like, they're coming out of paintings and coming alive. Or is that just, it's like a memory of them. It's not really them. And it's not really time travel or it is them, but they're dead. And it's their spirit or like, I, I you know, probably help if I read any of the chapters so far. But if you have a hard idea or a theory about what's going on with Jinka Taxius, why he's there and what he's doing and what's going on with the spirits, uh, this is the tip of the iceberg clearly right here, so I'd love to hear more. Next up, suit up. It's a three-cost blue instant, and until end of turn, target creature or vehicle becomes an artifact creature with base power and toughness, four or five, and then draw a card. So just autopilot your mech and uh, you know hit him once for a lot and get a card out of it. They've got uh, one or two, like, permanent or recurring every turn uh, autopilot effects too. I think one's an aura and I think one's, I don't know, something else. Probably a standalone enchantment. I don't remember, but uh, they're really trying to push vehicles this time, which I wouldn't. Nobody liked it the first time around. I'm sure they were just like, nobody likes vehicles. It's probably anti-India racism. No, people don't like vehicles because they're confusing, stupid, and don't fit in the magic world. But well, then I guess if you're going to go full-blown mechs and jetpacks and DJs, which that card's coming up, um... <laughs> Well, might as well throw vehicles back in our faces. Next up, Kaito's Pursuit. That's right, we're moving on to black. These are obviously by color. It's a black three-cost sorcery. Kind of interesting that Kaito's chasing down uh, Tezzeret and uh, his increasingly more ridiculous arm that we see every time we see him. And of course, this is another Story Spotlight card. So, uh, target player discards two cards. Ninjas and Rogues, you control gain medicine until end of turn. Can you think of a more obnoxious card, even if Kamigawa didn't exist and this was the only thing they printed, was the black-blue Rogues deck getting this i guess they forgot that was a thing and you can't tell me that oh that was unintended that's one of the longest ago things i don't remember what sets rogues are from but they're still in the game and people in diamond and mythic still play them so now you get to not play your hand on top of it wonderful thanks anyway the flavor text is kaito knew every rooftop in the city and closed in quickly on his quarry but he knew nothing of the planar bridge until it was already too late oh he built another planar bridge i bet he built the one that teleported uh vorinclex to kaldheim although vorinclex looked awfully biological to me i guess once you've been uh completed which i've heard is pronounced completed even though it's not how they spell it i thought they were about perfection that's not perfect spelling anyway uh i think once they've been completed they can uh travel between interplanar portals because post mending now pre-mending people could just build a portal and woo ten thousand people through the portal let's go but post mending biological stuff could not go through to an extent because you could argue that the the bones the skeletons or whatever that they coated with uh that blue stuff L whatever it is over in uh, space Egypt, AKA Amonkhet, they had that army move through to Ravnica. So he brought the army of the undead there. Lazatep, I think it was. So like maybe that protected them and made them able to planeswalk, or maybe that was just the armor. I never read that God awful book and hopefully neither did anybody else. So my thing is the Phyrexian Praetors, uh, because of all their alterations are X percent, not biological. I don't know. Not biological at all. Doesn't look like it. That they could survive interplanar travel, they just didn't have a way to do it, and Tezzeret is Mr. I build Stargates, basically. <laughs> so he must have made a deal with them, showed up there, and uh, I don't know, the last thing we saw him do was work for Nicobolus to uh, steal uh, the Immortal Sun through a portal. Because that also wasn't biological. So with him uh, in timeout, I guess Tez was like, let's work for the next awfulest people in the multiverse. 
What is his problem? Maybe he just put up the Plater Bridge on sale on eBay and the Frexians bought it. I don't know. Makes as much sense as anything else. I have a feeling he's going to die in Kamigawa. I'm just saying. Next up, Debt to the Kami. Um, literally just threw it in because that is totally one of the ghosts from The Grudge. Or or it's the, 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 the chick that crawls out of the TV, Tamara. From The Ring, you know? Seven days. It's like, seven days what? Who are you calling me? Seven days to take advantage of these great new rates on your auto extended warranty. The movie was about spam calls, right? I, I haven't seen it in a while. And then it's like a haunted spam call. And then she like crawls out of the telephone and attacks you because you didn't take advantage of their stupid auto warranty scam. Oh, a spoiler alert for a 20 year old movie. <laughs> and also I'm kidding. This got so meta. Anyway, what does this stupid thing actually do? <laughs> you know what? We're already off the tracks. Okay. The greatest prank that I have ever played on you guys, and you know I've got some zingers in the last couple uh, years, was completely on accident. Okay, I said something like, if you don't leave a like on this video and subscribe, you'll get a phone call the second that this video ends, and it'll tell you you have seven days to live. Because like a week prior, I had made the um uh, the re-edited version of the Ring trailer, where I made it the, the Magic the Gathering movie trailer that got uh, canceled in 2018. Which, go watch that. It took me 18 hours to edit 48 seconds. Like, it is mandatory that you go watch that right now. Also, it is freaking hilarious. But anyway, I was referencing that and I was joking about it. And then, well, it, I think the video got like 14,000 views. Well, what happens when 14,000 people watch a YouTube video? Well, by sheer probability, about, like, I don't know, 5 to 10 of them got a phone call the second the video ended. <laughs> and everybody knows, like... I know my way around the internet, that's all I'm going to say, you know what I mean? Like, when I was in high school, just learning about IT, let alone college, me and some vigilantes used to uh, hunt down some creepers uh, on the internet. That was the Wild West back then, so I guess they, they either assumed, one, that I wasn't kidding and they were going to die in seven days, or that, two, I found a way to run some script that calls them. And if you're thinking, Des would never go that far for a prank, I have mailed people QR codes as a joke. If I had a way to trigger a script at the end of a video like a smart card to call you and say you're going to die in seven days, you are damn right I would do it. So I guess one person said they answered it like, who is this? And it was just like their work, like telling them to come in. And then the other nine, I assume, just like borderline had a heart attack. I should read the comments people left on that video, but I have no idea which one it was. But oh my gosh, was that funny. Just comment after comment after comment. You asshole, the phone rang right after this video. I'm just looking at the view count and I'm like, oh yeah, probability and math and stuff. Okay, so <laughs> what does this card do? Debt to the commie. Three cost. Black Instant, choose one. Target, opponent exiles a creature they control, or target, opponent exiles an enchantment they control. Oh, so it's a black enchantment removal. That's kind of nice. And there are quite a few entire tier one decks that don't run enchantments at all. So to throw on the uh, creature part and then exile, so because there's so much graveyard recursion that they had to resort to exiling. Yeah, pretty sad. They should have just calmed down with that. Or just said, uh, surrounding Kamigawa, you know, plus or minus four sets, we're just not going to have any enchantment recursion for the graveyard whatsoever. Because they've done that. Like, they, they uh, when, uh, let's see, BFZ came out before and after it for about three or four sets, they made it impossible to just remove a giant creature unless you're running black. And even then, everything was, you know, mana value this or less. Everything was, you know, a, a limit on it so that you couldn't just, oh, look, an Eldrazi Titan or Titan-sized creature came out. Well, it's gone. Two mana, it's gone. So don't tell me they haven't done that because they have gone to those links before. Like, really custom-tailored the standard uh, environment around one thing that they didn't want to just get ruined by control. I kind of wish they would do that more these days, because control is ruining everything. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. They need to just put a hard limit. They need to just classify cards as control cards, you know, no matter what type they are, and then just say, no more than 16 in a deck. Done. Just in standard, just moving forward. Because then they wouldn't have to retroactively change anything. And then never apply the rule to another format so they wouldn't even have to correct the cards. They would just be like, oh, from now on, we're going to put a little C in the bottom. I mean, just think about it. That would, that would solve the problem forever. No more pillow fort crap. No more, you know, super friends. Nothing. Wouldn't that be nice? So moving back to the real actual spoilers, after having a little fun, we got Reckoner Shakedown. Uh, it's a three-cost black sorcery. Target opponent reveals their hand. You may choose a non-land card from it. If you do, that player discards that card. If you don't, put two 1-1 well -well counters on a creature or vehicle you control. Oh, good. A three-cost hand disruption. 
It's a you pick, not they pick, whereas, okay, Mind Rot would have just gotten rid of two blind, but it's their selection. Arguably, depending upon the number of cards in hand, this would generally be considered the better option. But then give them a backup plan. I mean, if you're running any creature or any vehicle, okay, you don't feel like you need to uh, get rid of anything in their hand, or they don't really have anything left in their hand. Oh, now you can use it for something else. I don't like that. I really don't. Hand disruption should be like the most you're dissuaded from running it thing, or if they don't just get rid of it completely. Now, hand disruption is how you stop some really degenerate crap. Uh, my vote would go just stop printing degenerate crap. But they don't seem to be leading in that direction, so I guess they call this a correction. At least it's only one card for three as a sorcery, but like, that backup plan just screams, hey, everybody run this. And there's a really popular existing deck that like turn one, two, three, and four, they're, they're nuke in your hand. And you just, you don't get to play with anything. And then you're top decking, they're top decking. And then they just draw, 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 and you lose. The deck is just absolute cancer, and now we got this on top of it. So that is a shame. Next up, Reckoner's Bargain. It's a uh, two-cost black instant as an additional cost to cast a spell. Second artifact or creature, you gain life uh, equal to the sacrifice permanent's mana value. Then draw two cards. That's right. This is a black common instant with a positive card draw and a positive life effect. This could be like a mythic. Am I missing something here? I mean, I'm sure there's like better cards, you know, 20 years ago or something when they don't know what the hell the power level should be. Or really just the game worked differently and it was a different baseline with different card interactions. But like, th this, this is insane. Two cards for two mana? You gain life equal to the uh, sacrifice permanent's mana value and you get two cards for two, two mana. That's insane. Has there even been a card printed in the last 10 years that's even close to this power level? And they just throw it on a common, just willy-nilly, like, oh, okay, this is just whatever, just throw away common card. People are already running that other black card where you can, like, sack a, a treasure or an artifact or whatever and draw, like, another card or two cards or something. This blows that away. You gain life and you get two cards. I mean, th this is just absurd. If anything, it should have said non-token, bare minimum for both and then i feel like this probably should cost like four i wouldn't even be surprised if somehow this turns out to be the most played card or in the top five in standard in the color black i, I just i find it astonishing that they just made this a throwaway common how could they not recognize the power level of this and because we've already seen one of it an unlimited sack outlet and then this is a paid but really good sack outlet we might see the Rakdos Steel and Sack, aka Rack and Sack deck, come back, which remember last time resulted in a ban of the Cauldron card, or which is familiar, one of the two. I think it was the Cauldron, I don't know, whatever, probably both. But yeah, this, like, they steal your stuff, and if they got two mana left over after hitting you with it, boom, they get a giant, giant benefit for getting rid of your crap. Or there's now a couple free or close to it sack outlets. Some of them, I think, require a tap or something. That is messed up. I never want to see that archetype ever again steal your defensive creature, hit you with it, sack it, and get a benefit. Like, that is that is too many things, and that is so aggravating. I've never seen players get so mad over anything next to Mill. I really haven't. I've seen streamers lose their shit over this. I'm sure I did at least once or twice. Read the room, wizards. Nobody wants this shit in the game. So next up, return to action. Yeah, a lot of these nutso cards are in black. Uh, two cost instant in black, another common, until end of turn target creature gets plus one plus zero oh and gains lifelink, and when this creature dies, return to the battlefield tapped under its owner's control. So auto resurrector with an ETB, so it doesn't prevent the death, it lets the death happen, then brings it back, which, if you have ores or equipment, it's bad, but, well, just don't. Which, okay, now easier said than done in draft, but, you know, who knows what you're running. But, like, an attack boost, instant speed, obviously, because it's an ambush, and lifelink, and you get your creature back. Boy, for two mana in black, I mean, that's not unheard of, but that is like one of the best ambushes I have ever seen. And you guys know my my most played ongoing tried and true strategy in sealed or draft is instant speed ambushes, and I very commonly play white black. If I can plus three plus oh something and survive or plus two plus two and just it's basically a kill spell or oh, I overflowed you attacking seven into five, you let two through, boost this one, you're dead. I mean, Ambush Boost. I love Ambush in Draft. I love it. So I like this card, but I just wanted to warn you guys, like, one, watch out for this, and two, holy crap, draft this. So next up, we got the red cards. Um, I think this video is long enough, and there's quite a few to go. 
Uh, there's actually some more rares and stuff, so I'm going to hold that till tomorrow because I actually have a little bit of sore throat today, which is unfortunately delaying the video that uh, is going to outline the game that's just going to stop everybody in the nuts, including Magic, in 2022. The game is awesome. I'm a huge fan of it. A year and a half of balancing has already gone into it, and it's... It's the most well-planned out game I've ever seen. You can teach somebody it in five minutes, but it's deep. And it is very, very attractive to Warhammer players, tabletop players, TCG players, CCG players, I guess, probably too, RTS players. It's like they took every game I love, smashed it together, and everybody who's ever seen the game is just like blown away. Full disclosure, they're sponsoring my channel, but if, if they wouldn't have paid me, I'd be covering this as just the most crushing perfect TCG I have ever seen. I remember I was pretty excited about Keyforged. I thought uh, DBZ and uh, Final, Final Fantasy looked pretty good. I thought my initial impression of Flesh and Blood was like, oh, that's kind of neat how that works. Okay, I could see it. But this is on a whole other level. So yeah, as soon as my throat heals up, hopefully Monday or Tuesday, I was unfortunately at a very loud event and with zero humidity for, I don't know, 10 hours or something. And I'm still recovering from that. And I want to get a good, clean recording of that. So, um, yeah, pushing that out a little bit, but it'll be early next week. So watch for that, plus the remaining spoilers. And I'll see you guys next time.